let's let's start from the beginning. So, um, hi, my name is Russell Up. This is the Academy Gaming Hour. We're here every week talking to various people in the gaming uh, industry and gaming community. And this week, we're really, really fortunate to have uh, Drinkbox Studios and their game Severed. Uh, this is Graham and Chris. Um, and in case anybody doesn't know who you are or what your studio is, could you give a quick rundown of uh, who you guys are? Sure. Uh, so we are Drinkbox Studios. We were formed in 2008. Uh, we've made four titles. So our first game was Tales from Space about a blob, which is probably our least known game. Uh, then we came out with Tales from Space Mutant Blobs Attack for the Vita. It was a launch title. And following that, we made Guacamelee, which is probably what we're best known for. Then after that, oh, we've done five titles, sorry. Then after that was Guacamelee Super Turbo Championship Edition, then of course Severed, which makes it the fifth. I forgot. Very cool. And you guys are based out of uh, Toronto, is that correct? Yep, that's right. So uh, I'm curious about that a little bit. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, um, the game dev scene there? How has it been working in that area? And how did you guys come to create your studio as well, if you don't mind answering all those questions? <laughs> yeah, it's, why, why it's going to be a long, studio creation, a like, long answer. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, the people who founded Drinkbox, there was, uh, there was three of us, all ex-programmers, and we were working at a, a company called Pseudo Interactive, which was in Toronto. Uh, they were like a 50-person studio, and they were making car combat games uh, for... Xbox 360, and uh, I think they did a PlayStation 3 launch title uh, for called Full Auto 2. Um, so yeah, they, they made a game called Cell Damage, which did really well. They made a game called Full Auto, which did quite well. Um, <clears throat> and we were working there, uh, and then I guess the interest in car combat games started waning, and they, they were having they were having trouble finding a publisher for their their latest game. Um, they did end up signing something, but it got cancelled, and so... <laughs> the car kind of combat <laughs> niche market was yeah. slow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the company ended up uh, shutting down, and uh, at that time, most of the 50 employees, they just... They basically left Toronto, because at that time in Toronto, there wasn't any other big studios. Uh, there, were, there were a few other small studios, but this was before Ubisoft had moved into Toronto, so... There was no one really left. Uh, there was no one really in the city to absorb all those people. So a lot of them just like they went to work for Microsoft in Seattle, or I know a couple people went to Australia. A lot of people went to, to work in the U.S. for game companies. Some people went to Montreal. Some people went to Vancouver. Um, but uh, a few of us, we we didn't want to leave the city. We we even had job offers from other companies, but we didn't want to leave the city. Uh, so we decided to start Drinkbox up and. Uh, <clears throat> Um, even back then, that was that was around the time where there was a few notable uh, indie game successes, and some of those were from Toronto. Uh, so the first thing we did when we started the company was we started talking to those people. Like we talked to John Mack, who had uh, released Everyday Shooter on uh, PlayStation Three, and we talked to Marin Reagan from MetaNet, who had released N Plus on Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty, and those games were doing exceptionally well. So. Uh, we, we thought, you know, uh, we would try and make a go of it and start up our own indie company. And that's how, kind of how things started. Yeah, and I'd say you kind of fast forward from that time. Um, I, I think whether it's known or not, there's a lot of good incentives, especially in Ontario, for game companies. Mm -hmm. So I think since that, since in the last five years, the result of that has what seems to be Toronto maybe it's a bit bold for me to say, but is the indie gaming mecca or capital maybe of even the world. Wow. Uh, there's a gazillion awesome indie devs in Toronto now. Hmm. Uh, and it's kind of where we are at the moment and it's really nice. Um, there's just a really nice community that's fostered in the city. Uh, and it's pretty cool now when we go to LA for events or San Fran, a lot of the really great games we're looking at are devs who are from Toronto. So I think it, it helps because it fosters creative talent and keeps it in the city, which helps when you're trying to look for talent, and there's a whole bunch of other good bunch of reasons for it. Mm. Yeah, the, like the combination of the Toronto education system, uh, like with the universities yeah. and the colleges that have game design program, now, along with the, uh, the uh, Ontario-based financial support that you can get from the government, mm. uh, those two things together kind of really encourage people to start up uh, indie companies, uh, indie game studios in Toronto. Uh, especially in Toronto, just because you know there's there's a lot of people who come to Toronto to get educated and uh, like either programming or or you know Sheridan's here they have a really good art program uh, and then like a lot of the schools like George Brown have game design programs so you have all this outflux of you know talented people who are you know just coming out of school 
and you have these programs that can fund them uh, if they have good ideas it can fund them to make their first game and uh, you know those th two things together is kind of like causing this boom in Toronto that's cool so it seems like definitely the indie community is very you know cohesive and you guys work together and collaborate on a lot of things is that correct Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, and, like I just came back from lunch with uh, Nathan from Capybara, nice. um, and there's a lot of events in Toronto. Like, there's quite a few monthly events where people get together and they just, you know, all the indie companies are getting together and socializing and sharing stories and learning from each other. It's it's very collaborative. Yeah, I'll also say even from a business sense, it's really nice where often you're dealing with the same large companies, and so it's nice to you know large you know publishers or I don't know media companies. So it's nice to just drop an email to a local friend to kind of see what their experiences have been. Uh, and I think that in itself is also a huge benefit, just having someone to go to when you're not so sure. No, very cool. Uh, we, we're getting a couple of questions, so I'm just going to jump right into the game itself, Severed. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the game and the backstory behind it? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure the shirt. Okay, I'll, this one, I'll do that. Yeah, okay, fine. Uh, you can do the backstory. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, so Severed, um, I can't see what's being shown right now, but I'll just give you a high-level description of the game. Uh, so, Severed it came out on the Vita, and it's a touch-based uh, first-person dungeon crawler, I'd say. And so, you're in this pretty cool, mystical world, and you play as a warrior named Sasha, and essentially, you kind of are thrown into this scenario where you know something tragic has happened to your family and you're not sure exactly what and by exploring this world and meeting other NPCs who continue the narrative for you, you start to figure out what's going on. Uh, from a gameplay perspective, it's heavily focused on combat and I, a lot of it is touch-based combat. And what I think is important to stress is that it's not simple swiping per se that what we really wanted to explore with this game was uh, touch based combat where it mattered where you slash so a lot of these enemies I mean all the enemies will have certain attack uh, patterns that you have to figure out and know when to be avoiding attacks know when to parry attacks and know when vulnerabilities are exposed that you can then go in for an attack so we really wanted to explore having your finger actually be a sword. It sounds kind of cheesy, but uh, not a lot of games had done that up until this point, so for us it was kind of an exciting opportunity. I'm sorry, one second guys. I think we might have lost your feed for a second. Oh, is that because oh, you did that? Maybe you're not allowed running Twitch at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I just brought up Twitch so we could see what they're seeing. Yeah, no worries. I, I def we can, they, they can hear you, they just can't see you at the moment. Okay, let me try closing that and see if that repairs it. Okay. Okay. I'll check my one. Sorry, guys. One second. Close now. I mean, I suppose the feed most of the time will be them slashing somebody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we might have lost your video feed, which is unfortunate, but I think we can still hear you. But uh, uh, if you don't mind continuing like that, we can continue or we can try restarting. Uh. But we don't mind. Yeah, we're okay. We're not that great to look at anyway. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, we'll continue, and I'll try to fix that as we're going along. So, um, sure. But I think we, I think that they definitely heard all the gameplay features of it. Um, okay. Yeah, and if you want to had anything to add to that or Do have background to it, uh, like it's, it's origin story perhaps. The well, the the origin of the game. Um, <clears throat> our uh, our concept lead Augusto, who's actually the guy who also pitched uh, Guacamole to the team. Uh, he. Uh, he, uh, I guess we were working on Super Turbo Championship Edition, and uh, one, one morning I came into work and he had sent me this like 10 minute long flash video of this thing uh, with uh, the email said, couldn't get this idea out of my head. Uh, I, had to, I had to jot it down, and, and he basically made a 10 minute animation, which was kind of like, basically it was severed, uh, where you know, it had, the, it had the, the, this idea that you, you pan around in the world and you move forward, uh, into the next, uh, this kind of this node-based, you know, first-person dungeon crawler style of navigation, uh, and also the sword fighting with, uh, you know, different kind of enemy mechanics for parrying and, and counterattacking. Um, and for him, when when you ask him like, what was the source of inspiration for this? It's uh, 
he was starting to feel like uh, because he's originally from Mexico, his whole family is in in Mexico, and he's starting to have this. He's kind of like missing his family. This feeling of uh, this feeling of missing family is kind of uh, the source of inspiration of what you see in Severed. So in Severed, when you start off the game, um, in like the first five minutes, it shows you uh, that the the main protagonist, Sasha, uh, she's just gone through some traumatic event, and. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, her family is missing, so you set off on this quest to try and find your family members. Mm. Uh, so that's kind of what, that was kind of like the source of inspiration from him, uh, and that's kind of what kicked off Severed. That's cool. Um, people are asking porting questions. I don't know if you can answer those at the time, but uh, definitely from E3, you guys mentioned iOS, 3DS um, ports. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, iOS, 3DS, and Wii U, and the 3DS and Wii U are going to be uh, cross by. Mm. Um, so you can want to get the other one. And uh, PC, is there any announcement for that? Is what's also being asked? Uh, we haven't announced PC. I mean, the game does run on PC. We develop on PC, mm -hmm. uh, but the mouse is not as good of a device for the game as uh, being able to touch right on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I would not. I would not definitely rule out a PC for these. Yeah, I mean, a, a, I think a part of that too is we just. I think we just have to. F Really take an evaluation and see how well it plays with the mouse because the last thing, I mean we've said this before, the last thing we want to do is put out a subpar experience just to get the game on another platform. Um, yeah. So I think we'd like to avoid that. We've done a mistake in the past for sure, so I think we're just trying to avoid that at this point. Mm, got it. Uh, interestingly enough, with the inspirational, um, your inspiration that you get for your games, does it come from, I guess, culture? Is that your big influence, or is it just from different ideas from the game itself, like game ideas itself? It's kind of kind of comes from both. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> uh, like if you look back to Guacamole, and you can see it in Severed as well. Uh, we draw inspiration from a lot of. Personally, I draw a lot of inspiration uh, on the design side of things from games that I loved playing growing up, uh, uh, especially things that you know, are not as prevalent in today's gaming landscape. Uh, like, there are not very many first-person dungeon crawlers out there these days. Uh, like, Legend of Grimrock is a notable exception. Um, uh, so, so you know, and, and I used to love playing those games when I was growing up. So, you know, you, you go back to those games and you think about what, what made them interesting to you, uh, and you try and draw out interesting things from, from those. Uh, but in Severed, you see inspiration from a lot of different types of games, like... Uh, like Mega Man has has this mechanic that when you kill a boss you gain their power. We yeah. kind of have that severed. Um, it has Metroidvania aspects to it where, as you get new powers, you can access new parts of the world. Uh, uh, there's a, there's some inspiration from like Mike Tyson's Punch Out, where the first time you encounter a new enemy, you don't know what to do and you kind of experiment with them. Uh, you eventually figure out how to deal with them, and then then you move on to the next enemy. And uh, mm. in severed, we do quite a bit of that as well. So. Like we're 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 basically trying to draw from like uh, a lot of different sources, a lot of different genres, and pull in things that make sense in this world and, and put them together into something that's cohesive. Mm. Um, how does um, I guess for the process for your team work? Do you guys just bring up an idea? Does someone bring up an idea and then you guys like kind of debate it? Or I'm just really curious about um, your thought flow and the work process in your company. Uh, well, I guess there's I guess there's two ways. There's sort of the macroscopic what game gets chosen, and then I guess there's the what features get put in. Um, yeah, I guess I mean at least for the how a game is chosen, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, we I mean we haven't done the process a lot of times to be honest, but uh, we did do our first game jam a while ago, like Grant mentioned, and that's where Severed came about. And just before a game jam, what we'll do is. We'll ask everyone at the studio to come up with, let's say, two or three onesies, we call them, which essentially are one-page design documents, mm -hmm. which is some idea you think is cool, and that can include just art or include some mechanics to it. It's kind of whatever the individual feels best describes their idea. And so those will get compiled, and then they'll be sent around to the office, so everyone at the office can see what everyone else's ideas were, and then there's some sort of decision at what of what of those ideas maybe is most promising, uh, at least market viable plus studio viable from our technical background, and then uh, from then we split off in the teams, and each team gets assigned one of these ideas, and we try them out, and from that hopefully one idea emerges. Very cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you have anything to add, or 
Yeah, and yeah. even within like uh, the design of a single game, uh, we're often you know opening it up to the team to pitch ideas for like how to make something better. Like, oh, this doesn't feel good, or this is getting monotonous after after doing this like three times, it starts to get monotonous. And uh, basically, the whole team is always able to you know pitch their ideas. And I would say like ninety five percent of the ideas are are either you know too difficult or out of scope or those kind of things. But um, but then the five percent, the the good the good ideas that are achievable, those are the ones that will get into the game. So mm, got it. Uh, and that's interesting. Also, part about this game is the soundtrack, um, where you worked with Juno-nominated band uh, uh, Yamantaka. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, YTST uh, Yamantaka Sonic Titan. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so for that uh, that process, we uh, there was a Ontario government sponsored event called Music Makes It, mm -hmm. and what they did was they invited um, they invited people from different disciplines. Uh, so there was you know musicians and composers, there was game developers, there was people from TV industry and movie industry, um, and they all they all got together and basically it was kind of like a matchmaking kind of style speed dating. Uh, um, meeting ground, mm -hmm. and uh, though we met with a lot of people at that thing, and um, uh, actually to step back, when we were we were uh, starting working on Severed, uh, and we were trying to figure out how to announce the game, uh, we put together a, a video. It's like a concept video, mm -hmm. and you can actually see that on YouTube. We released eventually, um, but when we were putting together that video, we picked a we picked a song by a band called uh, Sigur Rós. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but uh, Sigur Rós. <laughs> not, not very uh, hip. So. <laughs> and, with them. and when we uh, when we were like, okay, yeah, so this song is really cool. It fits the mood of the game very well, and it's uh, we made the we made a you know an animation to go along with it. This concept video, uh, and then when it came time to license that song, we, we found out how expensive it was, and we were like, okay, this is like wh this is more than our entire music budget for the game. Mm. So. So then we went back to uh, we went back to okay so uh, how can we do this you know in a more cost efficient way and we started looking back at the people we met at this music makes it event and uh, Yamataka was one of the ones that uh, you know their style of music really fits what we were going for with Severed like pretty perfectly um, <clears throat> you know we we listened to their whole back catalog of music several times and it just seemed like such a perfect fit and luckily they're also huge gamers um, and they had played Guacamelee and so they know who we were uh, so then it just seemed like a really natural fit and they're also like they live I don't know uh, 15 minute walk from the studio uh, it ended up being a perfect fit and the music that they composed for Severed was fantastic very cool is there anything that in the game that um, maybe got cut that maybe you wanted to put in in the end or did you guys do you think you put all the ideas in the game that you wanted uh, all the ideas certainly do not make it. <laughs> you can speak there's, as best, I think. Well, there's a lot of failed experiments. Yeah. Um, you know, you you, uh, you think something is going to be good, and then I think I think of, of the things that got cut, the biggest things would have been some of the enemies. Like, we tried a lot of different types of enemies mm. um, with different mechanics, and, you know, some of them were just going to be way too expensive to polish. Some of them weren't intuitive. Some of them had technical issues. Some of them. Some of them just sucked. Some of them just sucked. Yeah, a lot of them just sucked. Yeah, like, let's let's be honest. Yeah. A lot of them just sucked. Um, yeah. So uh, while we wanted to have, you know, the game has a lot of enemies and we have enemy variations, but um, uh, we, you know, we designed a lot more enemies than what you're seeing here, and uh, you know, the ones that didn't really work, they they did get cut. Um, that's a bit. I think that's the biggest things that that got cut in the game were just a lot of the enemies. Mm. I'm also curious, you know, definitely a lot of talk about business and, you know, business sense, which I think is really, really fascinating. Um, is that a big issue up front that you guys think about where, you know, you guys really budget out every exact thing that you're looking for? Do you guys, you know, plan for over budget, uh, over time, other things like that? I'm just curious about that process. Uh, yeah, we definitely did. <laughs> um, so, but... You know, that even though we, you know, at the very beginning of the project, we put together a business plan, which makes some assumptions. <laughs> uh, s assumptions such as how long is the project going to go, how many people are going <laughs> to be on the project. Maybe you should say how long the project was supposed to be. Yeah. And how long <laughs> for the viewers at home. Yeah. <laughs> so initially, Everett was going to be a very small one-year project mm. uh, for Drinkbox. And uh, after about eight months, we realized uh, 
you know, we had our first demo, and it was about 15 minutes long. And we started thinking about, well, how are we going to turn this 15-minute thing into like a six-hour or five to six-hour experience? And it, will that experience be interesting for five to six hours? Mm -hmm. And the answer was no. Um, you know, we could we could expand out this 15 minutes with you know the current mechanics and enemies that we have, um, the current the current levels that we have. But it, we just thought that you know it's not, it wouldn't have been a game that we would be proud of releasing. We didn't think it would be received well. So we ended up taking a whole additional year to finish the game. It took two years total. So. Um, so you know you, you know you make your your plan at the beginning. You make a lot of assumptions like we can make a great game in one year, hmm. and then you know as you're approaching that year mark, you start to realize okay, <laughs> this game is not that good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can't make this game in one year. We can't, mm -hmm. or we could, but we wouldn't be happy with with what got released. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so yeah, e like even though we did our best to plan well, we still went way over budget with the project. Mm -hmm. uh, but we felt it was more important to release something that had you know high quality uh, than something that would be profitable but potentially damage the studio's reputation, mm -hmm. um, and maybe not even be profitable. Like if it's not well received, no one's going to buy it. So mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we planned for it. Our our plan failed. You know, some sometimes we do keep our schedules. Like Wakamili, we always planned for that game to be made in two years, and it was made in two years, so that was successful. But uh, um, yeah, it's not always the case. Yeah, um, I'm I'm sure you guys talked about this a lot too. But the decision to go Vita first and then port to other systems um, was that always the plan, or was that more of just you guys wanted to develop for the Vita the most? Yeah. Yeah. At the at the time when we started this project two years ago, we had released two games on Vita that had done quite well. Uh, it was it was kind of before people were talking about the Vita being a dying platform. Uh, so that one year plan, like let's get this game out in a year and release it on Vita first, uh, that was kind of always in our minds. But I mean, regardless, right? For example, if you look at the iOS market, it can really be hit or miss. And so even I mean, even today's Vita market. There's still this known factor of people who buy games, right? And I think we were really confident that we would be able to get information and news about the game to Vita owners, and we have really good, you know, contacts with people who talk about Vita stuff. So I think for us, it seemed to be the safest bet. So part of the strategy, I like to think, was us drumming up excitement and interest uh, on the Vita platform, and if it did well on the Vita platform, then it would make sense to bring it to other platforms, and that's kind of the scenario we're in right now, and I think it's playing out somewhat the way we had hoped. Mm, very cool. Uh, you talk about a little bit about, you know, drumming up interest as well. How do you guys, um, your event schedule and your event plan, your press, you know, releases, how do you market that strategy to drum up interest and everything? Do you guys go to PAX, and do you guys go to different events all the time? Yeah, I think the first time we showed Severed was at PlayStation Experience. Um, was that in 2014? Oh God, 2014. 2014. Yeah. yeah, that was the that was the first 15 minute demo that I was talking about when we we realized how are we going to stretch this out to six hours. Um, but that yeah, the game was really well received there. You know, there was a lot of excitement uh, built up there. Then we showed it at, at PAX East. Uh, the following year, no, we showed it at PAX East twice. Yeah, and uh, and at PSX, PSX twice as well. It's um, a, it's a lot of hustle. It's a lot of hustle. It's um, a lot of hustle. And I guess one thing that was uh, different with Severed, uh, because of that extra year that we ended up taking, um, it was kind of more difficult. Near the end of the second year, it was more difficult to get people to come out and see the game because they had already seen it, you know, several times over the last two years. So, um, <clears throat> so almost. It almost would have been better to hold back the announcement until we were farther along. If we had known it was from the start that it was going to be a two-year project, mm. might not have announced so early. Yeah, I mean, to be fair to people, they're just saying, just finish the game for <laughs> God's sake. I get it, you know. How many times can you show a, a, a demo? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. As an indie studio, um, how do you guys, you know, factor in, you know, publicizing the game, making a game, you know, profitable in this day and age of so many different games being out there, AAA releases and stuff like that. How do you guys compete? Oh. Uh, really our strategy I think is to try and make well, when you choose your when you choose your idea at the beginning, mm -hmm. you're trying to choose something that you think will have you know, a large appeal mm -hmm. if you can. Um, but at the same time you want to make something unique and interesting. So 
uh, to be able to stand out from the masses, you want to have something that you can point to that's like, hey, this game is different, but it's also exciting because it's doing this and that. Mm. Uh, so the, I guess like the very first thing you got to do is just choose what you're going to build wisely. Um, <clears throat> and then once you've, once you've done that and you're ready to announce, you really have to like get out there and hustle and hustle. Sp spread the message and make sure it's getting... You, make, sure, make sure you're meeting the right people and getting them to write about it. Make sure you're reaching people the you know play uh, gamers' eyeballs somehow. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work associated to doing that, and you, you know Chris and I both do a lot of that, especially Chris. Uh, yeah, I mean the one thing I will say is we're really lucky, right, as a studio, because I think we started making our own games when there weren't a lot of independent game companies going on, mm. so we got in a this really sweet spot where we got a lot of attention and I think at that point you establish yourself and you establish the company's name and so today it's a lot easier for us than let's say a new studio that's just starting out because people know us from our past games and I think that's a huge in so mm. Graham's right it takes a ton of marketing effort still but I just also want to put that asterisk out there, there that we're very aware and fortunate how lucky we are to have gotten kind of in before many other people started making games. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, just a few more questions from me. Uh, one is, do you guys still have time to game yourselves? And if so, what are you gaming? Oh, good question. Yeah, I still have time to game. Uh, I am playing, I'm playing The Witcher 3. Hmm. Uh, I, I still play Destiny almost every day. Oh, wow. I'm a big fan of Destiny, especially the Take King expansion. Uh, what right. else am I SteamWorld Heist on Vita. Mm. Uh, uh, a lot of things. I'm looking forward to the PC release of um, Inside next yeah. week or this week, actually. Yeah, this week. Yeah. yeah. That looks amazing. What, uh, yeah, I mean, basically, I'll play whatever Graham sends me. <laughs> uh, the, the most the most memorable game recently I played was Pony Island. Pony which Island? Sent over to me. Uh, I still play a lot of League, uh, League of Legends. Mm. Um, yeah. I don't know. This, there always seems to be a game in your Steam library that you can play for an hour or two. I think I still play a lot of games, but not the same number of hours committed to each game. It's really sort of a, a taste, a half an hour, an hour taste, unless it really hooks me. Mm. Very cool. Play Uncharted? Uh, I still haven't played it. <laughs> I'm waiting for my brother to give me the copy. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there a game, and this might be revealing too much, but is there a game you would love to create in the future if you had unlimited budget, any time period, is there a game that you would love to create? The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, in fact, I feel the same game we want to make for. <laughs> is it something yeah. we might see in the future, near future? It's definitely, maybe not the near future. Mm -hmm. uh, the, this dream game that we have is pretty ambitious, and we're kind of like slowly taking steps towards making it. You know, we've been tinkering with it and building small prototypes and stuff, but. Uh, it's pretty ambitious. So, Graham, you're such a tease. I know. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't expect that game anytime soon, but uh, it's possible, you know, one day. We'll Very cool. Um, and finally, uh, two more questions. Uh, what's next for you guys? What's um, where you guys get, where are you guys going to be next? Um, what's your next big plan? So immediately, we are focusing uh, on the Severed, bringing Severed over to iOS and 3DS and the Wii U. Uh, so that's our immediate plans. After that. We've already started working on another another idea. Um, I don't know what else you want to add on to that. Yeah, we're most of the team is still working on Severed right now. Uh, I think there's like four or five uh, of us that are working part time on pre-production of the next thing. Yeah, I think there's gonna be some radio silence from us maybe. Yeah. In the next half year, which I think we're looking forward to. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're, we're going to try and put together a pretty strong demo before we uh, before we announce anything for our next. Okay. Um, and finally, if anyone wanted to follow you on social media or any other channels, uh, what are the social media handles or websites? Woo. Okay, so if you want to follow the Drinkbox, um, you can find us on Twitter at Drinkbox Studios. Uh, we have a Facebook page that's Drinkbox Studios. We have a website. We have a blog which we like to update somewhat regularly. That's drinkboxstudios.com. What else? <laughs> Those are the main ones. Yeah. yeah. And then um, the game is out already on Vita, and it's going to be on iOS, 3DS, Wii U very soon. Is that correct? Yeah, we expect to launch all three versions uh, sometime this summer. Very cool. 
Alrighty, and uh, is there any last messages you'd like to say, or anything you'd like to add to anyone, fans, or anyone watching? Uh, not really, just that, you know, we really appreciate, honestly, with Severed recently, the support of people who own Vitas, and even people who don't own Vitas, but like Drinkbox, uh, the support on Twitter and Facebook and at shows has been really awesome, and it's humbling, and we honestly love people for it. We don't even deserve it, but... <laughs> No, but I mean, I think what you guys are doing is quite amazing, and I think you do have a very awesome fan base. So, um, thank you guys not only for your games, but thank you for coming on and taking time to talk to us. Oh, no problem at all. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. So yeah, again, uh, this interview will be up on YouTube um, in a hopefully later tonight. Um, again, um, Severed is out on Vita. It'll be out soon on 3DS, iOS, and Wii U. So uh, thank you again, Graham. Thank you again, Chris. And uh, we'll talk to you guys. Uh, later. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Bye, guys. Bye. See ya. It's my good